We're beginning a new summer series that's intended to prepare us for a new season, a season that we're stepping into. The groundbreaking was last week. We know that we're going to be stepping into a new church building. The community is aware. They're watching. And we need to be ready for the moment. I'm going to entitle this sermon, uh, summer sermon series, Image Bearers. Image Bearers. Our key verse for this series is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Let me say that again. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. And the word bear means to wear permanently to wear permanently. How many of you know that this Christian walk isn't a weekend thing? It's an everyday thing. And it's a powerful thing when people see your life that you are permanently bearing the image of the heavenly man. I want us to pray and I want the Lord's hand to be upon this sermon series in Jesus' name. Lord, Thank you for giving us a name that's above every name. And thank you for giving us a word, the word of God that is just cannot be exhausted. The truth that's in it, the revelation that is there for us. Truly, it's like the manna. It's just daily bread supplying our need. I pray that you will give us a hunger, a desire to receive this word, to live it, to embody it that we as a church would bear the image, your image, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. To be an image bearer is to reflect God's character to our world. That is a note taker moment right there. So I'm going to say it again. To be an image bearer is to reflect God's character to our world. Image bearing doesn't just happen when we gather as a church. It happens when we engage our community. It's easy for us to be triumphant and apostolic and spirit-filled here, but it's another thing to bear the image of Christ in this world, to operate in those giftings and to, to uh, manifest the spirit of God to our world practically. We bear God's image through our attitudes, actions, and reactions. Note takers, practically, we bear God's image through our attitudes, actions, and yes, reactions. Everybody say reactions. Reaction, reaction is the thing we didn't prepare for. Yes, you've heard me say we're like a tube of toothpaste. You don't know what in, what's inside of you until somebody puts the squeeze on you. And nobody tells you when the squeeze is coming. But when the squeeze is on, you find out real quick what's on the inside. And so we bear God's image through our attitudes, actions, and reactions. We are image bearers. We are image bearers to our homes. Our kids are watching us, Dad. We are image bearers to our schools. Yes, our classmates are watching us. We are image bearers in our workplaces to our neighborhoods. Second Corinthians chapter three and verse 18, Paul says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. Paul says we are being transformed transformed into the same image talking about the spirit of our lord we are in a divine process we are daily laying aside the filthiness of our flesh and spirit and we are actively being perfected right we are desiring to perfect holiness. We are desiring to perfect Christ likeness. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 for whom he foreknew, he also predestined for what? For what purpose? To be conformed to the image of his son. 
that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Everybody say conform. Yes, we are being pressed into a mold. Now, you might generally think that's not a good thing to be pressed into a mold. In our human intellect and our human mind, we love to express our individuality. And there's room for individuality. And there is room for us as a unique person. But I believe that we are all equally called to bear the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. That if I'm going to be conformed to anything, I want to be conformed to the image of our Lord and Savior. There are three passages in Genesis that support the fact that we are to bear the image of God, that, that uh, really we were created for that reason. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. The fifth chapter of Genesis contains the genealogy from Adam to Noah. And it begins with Genesis chapter five, verses one and two. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. And the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. Mankind was made in the likeness of God. And then the third supporting text is given to us within the context of God's blessing upon Noah immediately after the flood. God says to Noah in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. So these texts all give us this word image. The English word image translates uh, from the Hebrew word salim. When you study the word image, it means, write this down note takers, it means to be a resemblance, a reflection of something greater, a resemblance or reflection of something greater. That's what I aspire to. I want to be a resemblance, a reflection of something greater. We were created to be an image of an image. Almighty God. And today we are called to reclaim that image that was lost to us because of sin. We are called to reclaim that image and bear that image to our world. This image that we were created for and we are currently called to bear is not just any image but the image of God. And when we think about those two predominant trademarks of God, that God is love and God is holy, is that the testament of our life? Is that what we portray to our world? Is that what our children see when they witness our life? Is that what our neighbors see? Is that what our world sees? Do they see Jesus in us? Do they see his love? Do they see his holiness? There's another passage in Genesis that provides us with deeper understanding of what it means to be made in the image of something. Because Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3, the Bible says, And Adam lived 130 years. That's a lot of candles on the birthday cake, folks. 130 years and begot, begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. So the scripture is just letting us know, boy, he, he had a boy like him who resembled him, who was a reflection of him. If we were to take Pastor Hoffman's kids and we, we had all the kids sit up here on a Sunday, Sunday and we scattered those kids all throughout the sanctuary, I don't think you would have to have discernment to know who the Hoffman kids were. Have you ever seen the Hoffman kids? They're beautiful. 
And they all look like their mom and their dad. I know who you are. I know who your parents are. There's no doubt because of their resemblance about who their daddy is, who their mommy is. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 tells us that God created a man and a woman in his own image. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Only man is explicitly stated as being created male and female. Everything else, he says, they were created after their kind. But in this, the creation of man, explicitly it tells us that they were created male and female, both man and woman were created by God, for God, with a purpose to bear his image in their respective roles as a man and as a woman. Men and women are equally awesome, but they have unique roles in the family. And the church said, amen. amen. And at this church, at ATC, we practice that distinction as prescribed by scripture and the way we live as a family unit, even the way that we dress, it is to be God honoring. It's to be God honoring. It's supposed to be done in a way that God intended it to be. Now, because humans have been made in the image of God, we are unique among all that God has created, everything that he has made. And when you really study the animal kingdom, there is quite diversity in creation. It's just awesome. I love to watch animal documentaries. If I have a little downtime, I like to watch animal documentaries. And the most recent animal documentary that I've watched is about the mantis shrimp. Have you guys ever heard of the mantis shrimp? It has the most powerful strike in all of the animal kingdom. And people have literally been injured picking up this thing that they can pick up with their hands. It strikes so fast that it, it turns the temperature of the water around it. This is what the documentary said. The same temperature as the surface of the sun for a split second. And it can smash a crab. It can smash any type of a mollusk and just annihilate it with that strike. That is cool. That's cool. But man is the only creature God has made that lives in two worlds at the same time, just as he does. God dwells in this realm of the human economy among us. And he is also in the realm of the spirit. God can manifest himself in the realm of the human economy. And certainly he exists in the eternal now of, of, of heaven. We are flesh and spirit. Did you know that? We are flesh and spirit. We live in one world that is material one world that is fixed and permanent that we can interact with, with our five senses. But we also dwell in another world simultaneously that is not visible, but invisible, not material, but spiritual. And the other world is not held in our hand, but held in our heart. And one world is passing away and the other world is eternal. And because of this distinction of duality, flesh and spirit, we can commune with God who is spirit. We can know him, even though we are tethered to this human body. Body, we can interact with a God who is spirit. In fact, that's what we did just a few moments ago while standing in a physical building this morning. We worshiped a God who is in the realm of the spirit and we were impacted by his presence and by his power. This difference makes us separate from any other created being that God has made. We are unique, distinct. And there are other differences. Like God, mankind has free will. Mankind has the capacity to choose. Anytime you have choice, you have the power to prefer one thing over another thing. And all of creation worships God by design. I'm talking about other than us. All of creation 
worships God by design. Only man worships God by choice. That's what makes today so powerful. The fact that you're here, the fact that you chose to be here makes your worship so powerful. And so we prefer God over everything else. We are prioritizing him in this day. And that gives me this special capacity to worship God. And the Bible says that he dwells in our praise. Our praise is attractive to God because we choose to praise like God, mankind is self-aware. Man is the creature that has uh, made, uh, for whatever reason, uh, it's almost like a hobby to study ourselves. We are fascinated with ourselves. We are self-aware. Elephants don't have small groups to talk about things they've been through. Dogs don't write books about themselves and asking why they chew shoes. Birds don't wonder why they fly and don't slither like a snake. We study who, what, and why we are. That's why we read the birth order book. I'm the firstborn. I'm the middleborn. I'm the last born. And that contributes to why I think the way that I think. We read books about human personalities. We want to, dis we, it's powerful, this self-actualization of discovering who we are. And, oh, that's my personality. And that's why I think this way. And, and that's why she thinks that way. Self-help books. Stages of life. Studying our genealogy so we can discover more about ourselves. The animal kingdom isn't quite like that. My dog, Britton, doesn't use our computer to see where her ancestors came from. She's an Australian shepherd, and could you, imagine, could you imagine if she found out that there was a poodle in her lineage, how devastated she might be? But, but we talk about ourselves. We talk about each other. We want to know more about our species. We want to know more about what makes you run, what makes you tick, and what about those baby boomers, and what about those Gen Xers, and what about those crazy millennials, and what about those Gen Zers? Animals don't consider those things. We choose how we portray ourselves on social media. We create a narrative about ourselves. We care how people look at us. We choose how we perceive the world. Like God, we employ complex solutions to our problems. So we have this massive service industry to meet people's needs. We have a massive medical industry to meet people's needs. And because of our sophistication and creation, our free will, our self-awareness, our duality, we have dominion over the world and all the creatures of the world. There's no creature quite like us. There's no zoo for lions who are the spectators and people are the exhibits, even though they're supposed to be the king, right? The top of the food chain. No. People aren't placed in the exhibit. The lions are. Orcas, the supreme predators of the sea, don't have an amusement park called Land World where humans jump over fences for the amusement of the young orcas. No. Because man as a whole is created both physically and spiritually like his maker. And as a result of this image, as a result of this image, as a result of the sophistication of us as God's image bearers, we rule. We have dominion. The power to rule is not necessarily the definition of God's image, but it is the result of bearing that image and being created in his likeness. But when man lost that likeness of our holy God because of sin, anybody know where that started? Anybody know where that started? Well, it started at the very beginning. 
the first man and the first woman and the very first residence. Sin began. And that began the disfiguring of the bearing of his image. The image has been marred because of the ugliness, the brevity that sin works in the lives, in our, in our lives and those who are around us. There were serious, life altering, eternity shifting consequences for Adam and Eve's choice. And it's been passed from generation to generation, and it's landed here on this generation. It's landed here in our minds, in our hearts. Innocence has been lost. Relationship with God was lost in the garden. Adam and Eve discovered that they were naked and they were ashamed. And because they disobeyed God, they were evicted from their home, but not before God clothed them with animal skins. God was the one to make the sacrifice, taking the animal's life, covering their shame. And that was all a foreshadowing of his plan, pointing to another time when he would provide the ultimate sacrifice, his body and blood poured out on that cross to cover the shame of the world and give us eternal life in his presence. I'm happy to tell you what Satan did to tempt the first image bearers in the Garden of Eden. What he did to unravel the order and peace, Jesus regenerated and restored. And I'm happy to have a house full of image bearers, people of his name, people of his spirit. Amen. Jesus was more than a man born in the likeness of God. He was more than just an image bearer. He was God incarnate. God with us. That's who Jesus was. He lived the perfect life and died the death that all should have died. He took the wrath of God upon himself. All the judgment and condemnation our sins deserved was imputed from us to him. His body was crushed for our iniquities and we live because of Jesus. We have hope because of Jesus. The image is restored to our life because of Jesus. We have no choice about when we came into the world. I was born in 1972. I had no choice when I came into the world. And I had no choice to whom I was born in this world, although I won the lottery. I've got a good mom and dad. And I had no choice as to what my giftings were. But I'm happy to tell you I have a choice today to live his purpose. I am called according to his purpose and I have the choice, I have the privilege to bear his image. I believe that is worthy of a hand clap of praise to the Lord. No choice as to when, where, how I came into this world, but I can choose to bear his image. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, and that you put on, everybody say put on. Put on, put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Put the new man on. Bear, bear his image to this world. This is so important. I don't want this sermon to be the perfect cure for your insomnia. I want this message to resonate in your heart. Because ATC, God is blessing our church. And we are moving forward. And I'm going to tell you, the devil is going to do everything he can to try to discredit your witness right now. And he's going to try to divide the church right now because we are in a critical hour. We are kind of in the seam. We're in between chapters in the history of our church. And the devil is going to try to do whatever he can to destroy the unity of the church. And we've got to make a, an unconditional commitment that we are going to bear his image to one another. And we're going to bear his image to this great city. 
Put on the new man. Put on the new man. How do I put on the new man? I'm glad you asked. Number one, no takers, die to the old man. Die to the old man. How do we die to the old man? By repenting and saying, my way is not the way. My image isn't most important. My plan is not paramount. My life doesn't belong to me. And so I repent for my self-will. I repent for my sin. I repent for not telling the truth about who Jesus is by my life. Repent. Colossians 3 and 5. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Die to the old man. Die to the old man. Repent. Number one. Number two, bury the old man and put the image of Christ on. So we die, and then we've got to, the old man must die, and the old man must be buried. Romans 6, 4 tells us that we are buried with him in baptism. By the way, we have a baptistry here today, okay? If you, want to rep- if you will repent of your sins and say, I want to die to my old man. The old man's going to die. The old me's going to die. And I'm going to bury the old me. We can make that happen today in the waters of baptism. We will baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. And we will bury the old man. Praise God. And look at this, baptism, Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have done what? Have put on Christ. Remember what it means to bear? To bear means to permanently wear. How do we put Christ on? Right here. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Christ. What more motivation do you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Is there a downside to this? Some of you are looking at me and saying, Pastor Soda, you always talk about repentance and you always talk about baptism. You're probably going to talk about the Holy Ghost now. Yep. Yep. Right? I mean, if I have to sell Toyotas for a living, I'm going to talk about how good Toyotas are. And whenever you come around me in the dealership, I'm going to talk to you about Toyotas. Well, I happen to be in a better business, a transformation business, a life-changing business, an image-bearing business. Don't ever tire of talking about repentance and baptism and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is how lives are changed. We are not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Die to the old man, bear the old man, and put on the image of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are, have become new. You can't bear the image without dying to the old man and bearing the old man. Don't count on yourself to just be a good person. It doesn't work like that. You can't. Thirdly. If we're going to put on the new man, we have to put the nature of Christ inside of us. Be filled with his spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you do not do the thing that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, everybody say Christ inside of you. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now watch this. This is what flesh produces. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, 
fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of anger or wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you live after the flesh, you're going to die. We need something greater than our flesh. Thank God for his spirit. It's greater than the law of sin. It's greater than the power of our flesh. But look at this. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, uh, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the fruit of the spirit. This is what the power of the spirit will emanate from your life to your family, to your neighbors, to your co-workers. And this, my dear friends, is our summer series. I'm going to be itemizing the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm going to help us to understand how we can bear this image, how we can permanently wear this image, and how the Lord can factor in how we act, our attitude, and how we react. And I'm going to tell you something right now. This is what the world is looking for. The world isn't just looking for a doctrinal explanation. They're looking for a demonstration of a life well lived, governed by the Spirit of God. Wow. The Spirit gives you the power to bear the fruit of the Spirit. To bear His image. One of the last things Jesus said to the disciples before he ascended into heaven was Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. Everybody say witnesses. Witnesses. He said, you're going to be witnesses all over the world in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the world. Now, church, in the court system, witness means to present or represent. If a witness is needed, it's because somebody's looking for truth. We need to know what the truth is, so we need a witness. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive power to be exhibit A in the courtroom of your community. You are invited to present the truth, to represent Jesus Christ, to be a witness. And here's the question. You ready for the question? Here's the question. Does your life tell the truth about who Jesus is in the courtroom of your community? Are you a true witness or a false witness? The Spirit gives you the power to be a witness. We are made in the image of God, but because of sin, our flesh distorted his image. We are like that mirror that you see at the carnival. We don't rightly reflect Jesus. We distort his image. All of us are image bearers. Every person that we interact with is also given the privilege to bear the image of Jesus. That's their purpose. That's their calling. They may not know it yet. And so we must be very sensitive to love our neighbors, even as ourselves, even when we don't agree with their politics. Even when we don't agree with where they say the property line is at. There's dignity in their life. Seeing people as image bearers should change how we view human dignity and the sanctity of life. That's why at ATC we believe that abortion isn't a right, it's a wrong. Because human life was made in the image of God. But you know what? I have a feeling that even apostolics lose sight of the dignity of life when we start to see adversaries in politics and enemies of our constitutional rights, when we talk about the other political party and other persuasions, do we just see clusters of cells and a mass of molecules, or do we see a person that Jesus died for? Do we see a person that Jesus loves with a perfect love? 
I'm talking about the fact that we need to love people. Amen. Yes, we've got to reflect his image to our world. Even people that we don't agree with. Because God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And the church said amen. Amen. As the musicians come in Mark chapter 12. The scripture says when they had come. They said to Jesus teacher we know that you are true. And care about no one for you do not regard the person of men. But teach the way of God and truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it. He's talking about a coin. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. I share this passage with you to ask you a question. When people pick up your life, when they handle you, study and observe your life, whose image is on it? Whose image is on your life? Do they see you or do they see Jesus? Don't let Satan persuade you that your image is more important than God's image. Revelation 4.11, worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. I'm so thankful that we're building a new church home. But I'm going to tell you from now until our dedication service, I'm going to be demoting our church. Building. I'm going to be demoting the building. And I'm going to be promoting Christianity. And I'm going to be promoting authenticity. And I'm going to be promoting people. As beautiful as our new church home is going to be, our building will not be the persuasive evidence of Jesus to this city. Our witness will be. Our lives will either confirm or deny Jesus to the Fox Valley. Our attitudes, actions will reflect Jesus to our families and our neighbors. Would you stand with me? Happy Father's Day, Dad. I want to ask you a question and challenge you. What do your kids see? Whose image do they see? Can I tell you, it's so important that when our children see our lives, we're not perfect, but in the sum of our life, do they see Jesus? Can I tell you that when a child looks at his earthly father, that child should be able to see the qualities of our Lord. Did you know that if a child has a flawed view of their father, it's going to bleed into their interpretation of their heavenly father? If a child is loved by their dad, if a dad is attentive, if a dad bears the fruit of the spirit, it's easier for a child to believe that their heavenly father loves them. But if on the other hand, you are harsh, you are distant, you are not merciful, it's going to be a difficult proposition when your children are told that their Lord is their father. Let our life bear the image of our Lord to our children. And the church said, amen. Amen. We're going to take a journey together. We're going to be talking about the fruit of the spirit. I talked about the fruit of the Spirit in 2024. I'm sorry, in 2020. That was four years ago. And I talked about the fruit of the Spirit in 2020 because there was this little thing called COVID that divided a lot of people. Our church was not excluded from that. We had different opinions about how we should work 
and think about COVID. And there was, there were dividing lines. And I had to teach a series entitled Under the Skin, alluding to the fruit of the Spirit. But in this series, it's not just, it's not going to be a rinse and repeat of that series. It's going to be different. I'm going to take a different angle. I'm going to be talking about the fruit of the Spirit and how powerful it is to the gallery when we live that God honoring life and bear the fruit of the Spirit and how that can impact your world and your community. And I believe God's going to help us. And this is going to be a stabilizing time for us to rekindle our commitment to bearing the fruit and to rekindle our commu commitment to stay between the white lines in a time when no doubt the enemy will attack. Yeah, the devil's going to attack. And I'm not fear-mongering. I just know the devil's predictable. And just because it, he attacks doesn't mean he wins. Amen. I believe every plan of the enemy can be thwarted by the Spirit of God. I believe that. Amen. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That we are unique and distinct in all of creation. That we have the privilege to bear your image to our world. We need, Lord, we need revelation and understanding because there will be pop quizzes along the way. And we want to be ready. And we want to provide to our families, to our neighbors, to our workplace, to our community, irrefutable evidence of how amazing you really are. We don't want to be a distorted mirror, Lord. We want to wear permanently your garments of love and righteousness. Help us in Jesus' name, I pray. And church, I'm going to open this altar to you if you feel compelled to come and pray. If you would like to be baptized in the name of Jesus, if you want to die to the old man and repent, if you want to bury the old man, we have water here. We will baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. You can bear the image of God and live your purpose. In Jesus' name.